everyone, thanks for being here today. Uh, it's especially an honor for you to be here when the, the weather is so gorgeous outside. And I'm glad it's, it's a good sign for the future of American democracy that we have such a great turnout, uh, perhaps. Uh, I'm Nick Nicola. I'm from the Department of Political Science. I know uh, many of you. Uh, and I'm delighted to introduce uh, Susan McWilliams to you today. Um, I want to give you a little background on why we're here. In the beginning of time, no, I, I'm going to start uh, somewhere else. Uh, in 2005, I was in Oakland at the Western Political Science uh, Association meeting. And there was this huge event at that meeting. And the event was a panel to honor the 83-year-old Sheldon Wolin, this sort of giant in the world of political theory. And somebody said to me at the moment, if you wanted to get a job in political theory, this would be a great room to blow up. Uh, because literally everyone was there. I mean, it was unbelievable. I actually, Jerry Brown, who was then the mayor of Oakland, now the governor of California, it was so packed, he couldn't get a seat. Uh, he was standing on the side of the room. And um, the panel of speakers was amazing. Cornell West, uh, Bill Connolly, who probably doesn't mean as much to you as Cornell West, uh, Sheldon Wolin himself, but for me, uh, the person who absolutely blew me away, who I knew on paper but did, had never seen in person, was Wilson Carey McWilliams. Uh, and he was uh, just an amazing speaker. Uh, he spoke in a language that I could understand, which many of these other panelists, uh, I cannot say that of them. Um, and he was so direct and so funny and, and just so remarkable uh, that it sort of, he sort of became one of my heroes at that, at that moment uh, in, in Oakland. Fast forward to 2011, the scene is Seattle, and we are now at the American Political Science Association meeting. Uh, and there was a panel put together on these two books, uh, Redeeming Democracy in America and The Democratic Soul, uh, two collections of Wilson Carey McWilliams' writings co-edited by his daughter, Susan McWilliams, who's with us here today, uh, and a, a fellow by the name of Patrick Deneen. And that panel, it's sort of, I was thinking about how to describe my experience at that panel. Um, it was kind of like going to a, like a really good movie, where, you know those really good movies, you know, like, you know, uh, Life is Beautiful or Amelie or something, where you, you walk out and you go, I laughed, I cried, I, I was thinking. Uh, that's what this panel was like. Uh, and in particular, uh, the comments that Susan made uh, about uh, not only her, her father's work, uh, but also uh, her father's life uh, as, a, as a scholar and, and uh, as, a, as a member of her family. Uh, and so I thought at the moment, hey, I have to figure out a way to get Susan McWilliams up to Linfield. Uh, and with the help of the Dean Speaker Fund here at Linfield and uh, the Jack Miller Center, which is a group in Philadelphia, Foundation in Philadelphia, that uh, kind of, you know, is basically based on the idea that it's a good idea every now and then to get people together to talk about our rights and responsibilities as, as citizens. Uh, they gave us some money to have a Constitution Day event in the fall. And because I exercised amazing fiscal discipline, uh, <laughs> we had a considerable amount of money left in that little pot of gold. And so I, I, I asked them, I said, you know, can I use that extra money uh, to bring Susan McWilliams up uh, to, to Linfield to talk about democracy in America? And they said, uh, go for it. So uh, the, the generosity of the Jack Miller Center and the Dean Speaker Fund uh, have made this event possible. Uh, let me tell you just a little bit about Susan uh, before I bring her up here. Uh, she teaches, she's an associate professor of politics at Pomona College in California. Uh, she is an award-winning teacher. I don't want to get their hopes up too high, but I should say she's an award-winning teacher. It's going to be awesome. Uh, and uh, she teaches such courses as American Democracy in Theory and Practice, Politics and Literature, and Dangerous Books. Uh, she is at work on a manuscript entitled Traveling Back, uh, Political Theory in an Age of Globalization, and she is editing a volume on the political thought of James Baldwin. Uh, so in addition to these really interesting book projects, she also uh, blogs about pop culture, so you can read essays uh, by Susan on Mad Men, Lady Gaga, Modern Family. Uh, so I think you can get a sense of the, the kind of breadth of, of uh, her work and the kind of interesting thinker that she is. Uh, so, without further ado, I give you Susan McWilliams. Thank you 
so much for that nice introduction that horribly raised expectations in a way with which I'm not comfortable, and thank you all for coming. <laughs> um, let me start by taking you back 50 years uh, to the election of 1952. Uh, some of you will remember that in the election of 1952, we had the Democrat, Adlai Stevenson, um, a kind of bookish, professorial type, pitted against Dwight Eisenhower, the jockey, gregarious, friendly Republican candidate. And one of the great stories from that election takes place when Stevenson is giving a speech to some of his supporters in Minnesota. And Stevenson gives one of his speeches, and Stevenson's speeches tended to go on for a long period of time. They're very smart, very loquacious. And at the end, and, you know, at the end of this speech, a woman comes up to uh, Stevenson and says, Mr. Stevenson, Mr. Stevenson. And he turns around and looks at her and she says, I, I have to tell you, every thinking person in America is going to be voting for you. And Stephen turns to her and says, ma'am, that is not enough. I need a majority to win an election. And every thinking person in America is not a majority. Um, expressing dissatisfaction with the state of democracy in America is nothing new. Um, whether that dissatisfaction gets expressed in hostility toward the institutions of our government, hostility toward certain features of our culture, or even, as in Stevenson's one-liner, hostility toward other Americans. Um, in our own time, though, our persistent grumbling about the status of democracy in America seems nearly insistent. Um, although most Americans seem uninclined to agree about any kind of public issue these days, and to the point that where the idea that we're a polarized people is a complete cliche. Um, we know we agree about nothing. We're a polarized electorate. Yet, even in that culture of disagreement, partisan disagreement, there is broad agreement that our contemporary governance lacks the spirit of being, to paraphrase Lincoln, of by and for the people. Consider, for instance, the fact that for all of their differences, both the Tea Party and the Occupy movement have made reclaiming democracy a rallying goal. Even to the point where, and I think this is really interesting, they actually share a chant. Um, it was Tea Partiers who first said at their rallies, now, it's not a very good chant, but this is what it was. This is what democracy looks like. Um, and a couple years later, occupiers were saying the exact same thing. Um, and neither group was saying this uh, cynically. They were both saying it in earnest. This is what democracy looks like. Now, it's clear that what both groups mean by that slogan um, in the negative sense. It's clear what they mean in the negative sense, that the status quo is inadequately democratic. But it's not clear to me what either group means by that slogan in the positive sense. Um, do they mean that democracy is about having or expressing political disagreement in public places? Do they mean that democracy is a mob with a mantra? Do they mean that democracy must involve giant puppets and a drum circle, or a Betsy Ross flag and a band of white men in tricorner ha tri hats? To be fair, uh, protest slogans are meant to be catchy. They're not meant to spell out convictions in great detail. And yet I'm convinced that the problem I suggested is a real one, um, and a problem that's endemic, not just to the Tea Party years or the occupiers, but to Americans at large. That is, today I think virtually all Americans have trouble articulating a positive conception of what democracy looks like, even if we know that we're unhappy with what we've got. And recognizing that trouble, thinking through the nature and origins of that trouble, has to be the first step toward any reclamation of an American democratic life, and that's in large measure what I want to talk about today. So, um, let's start with the most, the earliest and most earnest expression of American life, where American public life starts for, for, to be expressed for us um, in, in earnest, at least for most of us, and that's, of course, at recess. Um, now, if you spent any time, as I imagine most of you did, um, on an, a playground when you were growing up. Um, or even if you spend time on an American playground today, I have a small child, so I know what I am talking about here. One of the things that you will inevitably see if you wait long enough is the taking of a vote. Right? Should we pretend that the jungle gym is a pirate ship or should we pretend that it is a spaceship? Take a vote on it. Um, should we play dodgeball or kickball? Vote on it. Or the recent controversy at Memorial Park in Claremont is that animal that the children like to climb on uh, a turtle or a dinosaur? Vote on it. 
right? Majority rules. If you listen to um, kids on American Playground long enough, somebody will make a claim, majority rules. American children learn very early that voting is the right way to decide things, and that the claim of majority rules is a trumping claim because majority rules is what we in democracy are all about. This principle is the essence of our civic education. It's a teaching reaffirmed not just in our classrooms and in our textbooks, but also in our media and popular culture. Think, for instance, of the endless vote taking we do on shows like American Idol or Dancing with the Stars. Um, voting is not necessary in these shows, and we all know voting doesn't necessarily lead to actually the best or most talented person being picked, but God damn it, we're Americans, and so we are going to vote to decide what the answer is. Now, for recent generations of Americans, this literally elementary understanding was all they needed to know in order to know how to improve the quality of American democracy. Here's what I mean by that. Throughout much of the 20th century, lots of people did not have the right or ability to vote. So democratic activists could rally around the principle that the vote, and particularly the idea of one person, one vote, is at the heart of democratic life. The animating faith of recent generations was, in large measure, the faith that we could achieve the dream of democracy in America by extending the vote. By and large, our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents believed that if we only let women come to the ballot box, or if we only dispensed with Jim Crow restrictions on suffrage, or if we only gave 18-year-olds the ability to cast their lot at the polls, our institutions would become more properly representative. And to the extent that our forebears were successful, and they were successful in extending the vote, they surely did make this a more democratic nation. And yet, while the extension of voting rights to virtually every adult in this country, with convicted and felons and uh, undocumented immigrants accepted, um, while the extension of voting rights to virtually every adult in this country has made this nation a more legitimately democratic republic in the formal sense, it certainly hasn't sentenced, uh, changed our sense or lessened our sense of democratic malaise. In fact, it's been in the very decades since this nation achieved something close to universal adult suffrage that Americans' discontent with our governments has increased. You know, as we've become more formally democratic, we've become more informally concerned. Um, that fact has become increasingly acute in the last decade, a decade in which, for the first time in polling history, a majority of Americans agree with statements like, America's best days are in its past, and America is heading in the wrong direction. So extending the right to vote has done many things, but it has not made us feel like a fundamentally more democratic nation. So the challenge for this generation is a tougher one, I think, in many ways, than it was for our parents and grandparents. We have to figure out how to talk about what makes for a healthy democracy beyond the act of voting. We children of the children of the civil rights movement cannot content ourselves with that dream that says one person, one vote is sufficient for the realization of a robust democracy. Now, if you think about that for more than a second, it really shouldn't surprise you, it shouldn't surprise any of us. For one thing, as you all know, just because people have the right to vote doesn't mean that they'll exercise it. Fewer Americans vote every year, especially in local and state elections. Voter turnout in those places is often below 25%. It's sometimes close even to 10 or you know, fewer percent. And if most people don't vote, common sense tells you, you don't have a very vibrant democratic life, whether or not the formal right to vote is there. But more fundamentally, I think common sense tells us that even a perfect realization of one person, one vote, were we to get there, wouldn't necessarily make for a democracy in anything more than a superficial sense. All we need to do is consider the fact that there are regular elections in countries like Assad's Syria or Chavez's Venezuela to know that voting does not a democracy make. Common sense also tells us that voting is only meaningful to the extent that we're presented with meaningful choices. If I say to you, let's take a vote, my lecture can last four hours long or eight hours long. Right? I've given you the ability to vote, but I've also excluded a lot of potentially important choices to you. Voting is only meaningful if we're pre to the extent that pre we're presented with meaningful choices. By the way, this will not be either four or eight hours long, so you can really pick this up. In other words, common sense tells us that voting is only meaningful if our vote and what it represents actually matter. With that in mind, part of the problem in the United States today is that we know our votes don't matter. Not really. Um, there was a great article in the online magazine Slate a few years ago 
Um, and the author of this article ran a bunch of numbers and calculated that the odds of your vote counting that is, the odds that your individual vote would actually change an election in a mid-sized state is about the same probability as you being murdered by your mother. Now, that doesn't mean that you should hide the knife or the kitchen knives from your mother. It means that the odds of your vote counting are almost infinitesimal, infinitesimally small. Um, you'd have a better chance of improving your life, the author of, the, author of that article said, to spend the time you spend waiting in line at the polls or filling out the forms you have to fill out to vote on buying a lottery ticket. And in fact, this is, I'm not making this up, but it astounds me every time. In New York State, you have a better chance of winning the Powerball jackpot 7,400 times in a row than of affecting the elections. We know our individual votes don't matter in America in the quantitative sense for the mere fact that this country is so god awful huge. You don't need a genius to be a genius. You don't need to run the numbers to see that. Um, Nathaniel Hawthorne identified this as a problem 150 years ago when this country was a lot smaller than it is now. Even then, he said, America is too vast by far to ever be taken into one single human heart. Is it even possible to wrap your mind around the basic fact of living in a country with 300 million other human beings? all of whom strive and love and struggle and laugh as actually and intently as you do. Probably not. The scale is just too much for our minds to comprehend, and I mean that quite literally. The British anthropologist Robin Dunbar, um, who stud studies the capacity of the neocortex in the human brain, has determined that the maximum number of people with whom any human can maintain stable interpersonal relationships is, does anyone know this? It's called Dunbar's number the maximum number of people that any human brain um, can, it can sustain relationships with. It's about 150 people. Um, even Facebook, um, which we all know plays fast.